Greetings, I am Sir Vancelot and welcome to my channel. This is the first video in a series that will introduce you to all of the Vocaloid vocal libraries and characters that were released from its very beginning in 2004 to the end of 2012. Vocaloid is an international musical phenomenon, but there's a lot more to it than just music. I hope that by the end of this series you will have begun to understand why Vocaloid and vocal synthesis in general has touched the hearts of so many people around the world. The beginning of this video will feature a brief segment on the development of the Vocaloid synthesizer, and then we will discuss the first Vocaloid products to be released commercially. Synthesizers have formed the backbone of popular music since the 1970s, and as the price of processing power and computer memory declined through the years, synthesizers became better able to emulate the qualities of real-world instruments. The human voice is, of course, the most beloved of instruments. But while people have been experimenting with systems to synthesize human speech for centuries, significant research into synthesizing the human voice specifically for singing is a relatively recent development. There have been a few examples of such singing computers dating as far back as the 1960s, but it was really in the 90s that computer technology allowed song synthesis to be developed in earnest. In this video series, we'll be discussing the efforts and results from the research of one specific company, Yamaha, which has been manufacturing synthesizers since its SY1 model from 1974. In 1997, Yamaha contracted researchers at the Pompo Fabra University in Barcelona, Spain, to begin working on a project whose goal was to, quote, make bad karaoke singers sound better. <laughs> a very Japanese thing to do. Okay, that might have been part of the goal of the project, called Elvis, but the research itself was for voice transformation, using a process called spectral morphing. It was basically technology designed to make one person's voice take on the qualities of another person's voice, i.e. make your voice sound like a professional singer's voice. Despite two years of work, this research was never turned into a commercial product because it required professional singers to provide recordings for every song they wanted to support with this technology. But just because Project Elvis ended doesn't mean it was time wasted the researchers began to think about a new project. What if, instead of recording entire songs, they could record a set of samples of a singer's voice, samples that they could then rearrange to form any song they wanted? Yamaha was on board with the idea, so a new project was started in the year 2000, and this time Yamaha sent one of their own to Barcelona to help manage the project, Kenmochi Hideki the man who would become known as the father of Vocaloid. The new project, dubbed DAISY, sought to take the lessons learned from the Project Elvis research to create a singing synthesizer that would sound natural and continuous, one that would flow from syllable to syllable smoothly, without noticeable gaps. Initially, the Project DAISY R&D was simply an experiment, but by March of 2002, the team had a working prototype and it impressed the suits at Yamaha. They began to see dollar signs, well, yen signs, so the team had to start turning Daisy into a commercial product. Yamaha could have developed the commercial version all on its own, but it was decided that licensing the technology to third-party companies would give the product its best chance of success. The program was first publicly demonstrated at a German music trade show in 2003, but because the name Daisy could not be trademarked, it was too common of a name, the ultimate name of the synthesizer would be Vocaloid, a portmanteau of the words vocal and android. If you've heard of Vocaloid before watching this video, then you're probably aware that it is most well known as a Japanese language product. The majority of songs created with the Vocaloid synthesizer are indeed in Japanese, and Japanese musicians have had the most commercial success with Vocaloid so far. But the synthesizer was not developed for Japanese exclusively. As I said earlier, the synthesizer technology was licensed to other companies around 2002. At least, that was the idea. Yamaha actually had a very difficult time finding companies that were willing to purchase the technology. 
It was so new and different that most companies didn't know what to do with it. At that time, Yamaha was only able to find a single company that was willing to take the plunge, a British company called Zero-G. Zero-G was established in 1990 under the name Time and Space, and it soon became a popular business in the UK that specialized in digital musical production software, music samples, and virtual instruments. So they could see the appeal and potential of the Vocaloid synthesizer. Zero-G would end up releasing the first three commercial products for the first generation of the Vocaloid synthesizer engine, today often retroactively referred to as Vocaloid 1. Aimed at American musicians, Zero-G began selling its first two Vocaloid products, Leon and Lola, on the same day, January 15, 2004. Indeed, the first two commercial Vocaloid products were English language, not Japanese like you might have been expecting. As you could probably discern from the names of the products, they even have those little gender symbols in their logos, Leon was a male voice synthesizer and Lola was a female voice synthesizer. They were separate and distinct products, but they were designed to work for the same singing style, alone or as a team. In fact, Leon and Lola were marketed as soul singers, as evidenced by this very early version of their product boxes and the marketing blurbs that accompanied their advertising. In terms of influence on the Vocaloid franchise, Leon and Lola were the first commercial releases to sing in English, so of course they were extremely important products that set milestones, and they kept the technology from being a solely Japanese experience. But in terms of impact on the music industry at large, or commercial success, they had a lot working against them. Leon and Lola were synthesizers, so they were marketed like any other synthesizer was at the time. They had internet and magazine advertisements, but they were marketed solely to professional, tech-savvy musicians. So if you weren't already involved in the music industry, you probably never heard of them. That and the very generic appearances of their boxes meant that they didn't really stand out from other products. Leon and Lola had the benefit of having no real competition in the marketplace, as there were no other products out there that could do what they could, but it was difficult to attract the amount of attention Zero-G would have liked. It also didn't help that they were fairly expensive when they launched. According to one review on emusician.com, in the August of 2004, Leon and Lola were each selling for $370 US dollars, and there was no discount for picking up both at the same time. I don't know how that compared to other digital instruments of the time, but it was still a hefty chunk of change. Apparently, it took five eight-hour days to record the samples for Leon and Lola, but this requires a little clarification, especially if you're already familiar with more modern Vocaloid products. The second version of the Vocaloid synthesizer engine, Vocaloid 2, released in 2007, and it was a completely different animal from the 2004 version. What made it so different was that Vocaloid 2 was a sample-based synthesizer. It used sampled recordings from singers as the basis for its synthesis, just like any modern sample-based virtual instrument. In contrast, the Vocaloid 1 engine used data taken from spectral analysis of voice recordings to create templates with which to manipulate synthesis output. It did not use recorded samples in its output. In other words, Vocaloid 1 voices are missing that real voice element that modern Vocaloid voices possess, so they inherently sound more synthetic because they are. That doesn't mean the human nature of the voice is completely absent, however. Leon and Lola won some awards and received a lot of praise from musicians stating how forward-looking they were and how impressive the technology was, and especially how expressive the voices could be. But while they were not outright commercial failures, they weren't breakaway hits either, and much of that was owed to their accents. Leon and Lola were aimed at the American market and were advertised as virtual soul singers. Naturally, American musicians had expectations about what a soul singer should sound like, especially since we associate soul music with African-American culture in particular. 
Zero G is based in the UK, and it decided to use the talents of singers close to home. While the identities of the singers have never been revealed, we know that the man who provided the samples for Leon was an established British African musician, and the provider of Lola's samples was a woman of Caribbean descent who was living in the UK at the time. Since neither of them were American singers, the accents of the products didn't mesh with the concept of soul singers that most of the customers had. It's not that Leon and Lola were only capable of singing soul music, they could sing in many different styles, but they were advertised as soul singers, so that's what customers expected out of them. We will discuss the importance of the characterization of Vocaloids in a later video, but Leon and Lola deserve special mention. Suffice it to say, Vocaloid fans enjoy the character designs that represent most of the retail products created for the software. The challenge for fans of Leon and Lola was that the products offered nothing visual for fans to represent them with. The only concretes about them were that one was male and one was female. That's it. Zero G gave them names to imply that they were virtual singers, but of course they were never intended to be relatable characters. And since the singers who provided their voices have never been revealed, even to this day, 13 years later, Fans who wanted to represent the duo visually had to come up with their own designs based purely on what the voices sounded like. As a result, the most popular fan designs for Leon often depict him as a blonde Caucasian. If that raises your eyebrow, please try to keep in mind that the creators of those designs likely did not realize Leon and Lola's singers were people of color. While that information wasn't necessarily kept top secret, it wasn't common knowledge at the time, either. Additionally, over time, musicians began to use Leon and Lola to sing different styles of music. So by 2009, for instance, the association between Leon and Lola and soul music had diminished significantly. So for those younger people just discovering them for the first time, hearing Leon and Lola used in pop or electronic music, they went where their imaginations took them. Those designs persist because they've been around so long, but people have certainly depicted Leon and Lola in other ways as well. Within a couple years of their release, Leon and Lola would be pulled from sale due to an industry-wide lack of consumer interest. But they would not be Zero G's only foray into the Vocaloid technology, not by a long shot. In fact, Zero G would release a third Vocaloid product later in 2004, and that's what we will talk about in the next video. As for Leon and Lola's software, with the rise of Vocaloid popularity in 2008, Leon and Lola were once again made available for purchase, but they were finally officially retired just short of their 10th anniversary in 2014. So it is no longer possible to purchase Leon or Lola, or any of the first generation Vocaloids for that matter. Because the synthesis engine is so radically different from subsequent versions of the synthesizer, the voices are incompatible with modern versions of Vocaloid. And even if you could find an unused copy of Leon or Lola somewhere, it would not be compatible with versions of Windows newer than XP. I don't even know if an unused serial code would work anymore. For financial reasons, Zero G currently has no plans to re-release or update Leon or Lola to make them compatible with more modern systems, unfortunately. Now we come to the song demonstration segment of these videos. As I do with all of my Vocaloid history or showcase videos, I'm going to play several songs featuring Leon and Lola to show you what they were capable of. If this is your first time hearing Leon and Lola though, I want to mention two things. First, don't expect to see a lot of professional quality original songs here. The Vocaloid software did not become very popular until years after Leon and Lola were released, and it took a couple years beyond that for the English language Vocaloids to begin to develop a sizable fan base. By that time, there were newer, more realistic vocal synthesizers available. As a result, most of the songs I share here will be cover songs. And secondly, these products were not intended to faithfully recreate the human voice such that they would be indistinguishable from a real singer. 
that would have been a very unrealistic goal for 2004 technology. What made Vocaloid revolutionary for its time was how expressive and human-like the synthetic voices could be, so that's the quality you want to pay attention to. But even if they aren't the most realistic sounding voices, remembering that they were developed almost 15 years ago, I think you'll be able to appreciate them.
when they think you've lost control and roll and roll and roll and no one returns your toll You won't have to say your soul You can just be my baby